what's come along after this is the idea of what's called NoSQL or not SQL databases. And one of the advantages of these not SQL databases is they can scale better. So an example of this would be, let's say, Bigtable from Google or DynamoDB from Amazon. So both examples of NoSQL databases. So these, so for instance, let's look at Bigtable and Dynamo. These are both key value databases. So you have a key and you have an associated value. We're going to look at a document database. Okay, so we're going to look at one called Firestore. Uh, it was developed outside of Google, but then Google bought them several years ago, I think in 2014, 15, somewhere along about that time. So this is a document database. So the idea of a document database is we're basically, okay, this is kind of roughly storing JSON. Okay, uh, with some limitations. So we have a particular document and that stores uh, the JSON for it. The limitations on arrays. Okay, so in particular, arrays can't contain arrays. Other limitations are the document size has to be less than one megabyte. So let's just look at an example. Basically what you could be storing, for instance, is let's say if we looked at users, you know, you could be storing a name, you know, Prof Rhodes and a, let's say email, you know, Rhodes at, and we could store an ID. And you may say, how the heck is that different from a, U, from a SQL database? Well, the difference of the SQL database is in the SQL database, these tables are predefined, right? They're defined, they're, these are called the schema and they're defined up front and making change to those schema is a big deal. So adding a column, big deal. Removing a column, big deal. In the case of document databases, the database doesn't have any specification ahead of time that every document, so this is in the user's collection, okay? Because basically a database is a bunch of collections. And yes, there's a rough correspondence from collections to tables, roughly. So, but the difference is we can easily have uh, for a particular user, have a name, an email, an ID. We could have another user that has no name. We could have another user where we've added on five more fields for that user, right? We can have a data a collection where we've got a series of documents in that collection with some particular set of fields. And we can start making more documents that have extra fields, not a problem. In the case of the um, relational database, that's no good. We've got to have the schema. So these are also sometimes called schemaless. That is, we don't define a schema ahead of time. We just get what we get. And it's up to the application uh, who's using this database to do reasonable things. So you wouldn't want to have a collection that includes users and lists and list items and all sorts of disparate things. You still want a collection to have things that are similar to one another, but the structure of them doesn't have to be identical to one another. That's sort of the difference, that particular documents in a collection can have additional fields or 
can be missing some fields. And you don't have to define this ahead of time. You can just, again, in version 1.3 of your application, you may say, you know, it'd be sort of nice if we started adding this particular field to new documents. So the old documents wouldn't have it, the new documents would have it. You wouldn't have to go to your database administrator and say, hey, we need to make some change to this schema. Okay, so we have collections. So database consists of collections of documents. Document is JSON-like, so we can store dates or date slash time. We can store strings, floats. Uh, integers actually get converted to float for you. We can store what they call maps. So this is really, it's just a JSON object. So it's got fields and values and each of the values can be of these same types. Uh, we can have arrays. The limitation is we can't uh, in an array contain arrays themselves. And that prevents this uh, nesting. Well, so we can have nesting with maps. We can't have nesting with the arrays. And the basic reason for that is not unlike when we're looking at list items that we're creating with React, where we create we can create uh, an array of list items. And React says, hey, if you want to create a list of uh, an array of list items, I want you to provide a key for each one because I want to tell beforehand and afterhand what the, what the difference is, okay? Here, what's going on is documents can be updated asynchronously and in parallel. So I might be editing a document at the same time you're editing a document. And so you might say something. So what we might say something is like uh, change the name. You might say, and I might say, let's say, um, delete the name. Okay, that's okay, right? If I delete the name, and then you go change it, that's gonna basically just add it. If you change the name and I delete it, then it's gonna be gone. So the ordering matters, but that's okay. But the problem is what happens, so even if we have something nested, right? if we wanna change you know, a.b.c.name, some deeply nested thing in a map, we can still you know, delete a.b.c.name, that would be fine. But the problem comes about if we have an array Right, so let's say we have an array of items and we want to change, uh, uh, let's say names at zero and delete names at zero. Right here, the problem is if we delete names at zero first, the first name is gone and the change will then actually change what was the second name. So if the names are Joe and Sally, and we want to change Sally, sorry, we want to change Joe to Joseph. So this is the desired change, right? And then someone else wants to delete Joe. So the, what will happen is, what should happen is we end up with just Sally, right? After the delete, or maybe we end up with a new Joseph and a Sally. But what can happen is let's say that the delete happens first and then the change. So the delete happens, we no longer have a Joe and now names at zero is actually Sally and we've got an issue there. So, so we have changed the ordering of these things, okay? The solution is we're not, we, we, we don't actually get allowed to change names at zero. 
Okay, what we can actually do, all we're allowed to do with these arrays is just add an element or remove an element. So what you could do is you can add an element if it's not there. So it basically unioning it into what's there. So if you had um, colors, for example, red and green and blue, if you add green and green's already there, it just stays as red and green and blue. But you can think of it really is as a set instead of an ordering. Okay. The, you don't have a complete control over the ordering when something actually gets added. The, there is a hierarchy, however. So a document and contain subcollections. So let's look at that same example where we had users, lists, and items within lists. So a way you could represent that is you could have right, a user, and then you could have a subcollection. So a subcollection which is, let's say, the lists subcollection. So we've got now, I'm just representing this sort of as a collection of users. Within a particular user, you can have then a subcollection. So this is users, this is lists. And within the list subcollection, we can have a bunch of lists. Unlike the rows in the schema database, same thing happened, same thing applies is that the database doesn't know, have to know ahead of time what fields are in each of these list documents. So this is a doc. This is a doc. This is a doc. This is a doc. And this is a subcollection. So it's just like a collection, except the only way to get there is from its owning document. This is what's called a root level collection. Okay. So it's available just by name. So we can get to users by name, but we can't get to those lists by name because of the fact that the only way we can get there is from a document because it's a subcollection. And then what we could say is, okay, lists are each going to go ahead and have a subcollection of items. So if you wanted to, for example, get the all the lists. Let's say get the first 10 lists of user 562. Okay. So what I'm going to give you is some pseudo code uh, for that. We'll be looking at the actual API at a later point. So what we could do is something like, you know, roughly something like that. First, we'll get the user document. So we'll go to the database. Uh, we'll get basically the user with ID, user ID. So just as an aside, we can re represent particular documents by looking at, let's say, collection, and then every document has an ID. So that's actually the way we can access. So we can look at collection, ID, subcollection, 
subcollection ID, subcollection of that, its ID. So we always trade off between collection, document, collection, document, collection, document. That is, we can't have a, uh, a document that contains multiple documents. We have to have a document with a subcollection that contains multiple documents. Similarly, collections can't contain other collections. Collections have documents, and those documents have subcollections. So in any case, so we will go ahead and get the particular user record and or user document. And from this user document, we could get anything that was in there. So we could get the name, we can get the uh, ID, although it's redundant because we just use the ID to obtain it. Uh, we can get the email, we can get whatever is in there. And then from that user, we can get subcollections. Okay. So we could do, let's say, user dot get. Okay. So we would want to get the lists subcollection. And that list subcollection, we can then, let's say, order by the creation date. And also, we could limit it, let's say, to 10 items. Okay, so this would then give us our lists. So it'd be a subset of all of the lists for this particular document, a subset because we asked for us to limit to 10. And the reason we limited to 10 is again, because our application is displaying at most 10 items to begin with. And so there's no reason to try and get more than those. One thing to keep in mind is that the costs here are usually on a per query basis. So if we look at Firestore, the costs you're basically paying, are you paying a storage cost? You're paying a cost for uh, egress, that is data leaving the Google network, and then you're paying a query cost as well. So a cost per query. Actually, that's not 100% uh, true. I believe it's a cost per document. Let me just check that. So your pricing, and there is a free tier, by the way. But your pricing is storage and egress. That is basically network IO, and then document read writes. So. In the case we just looked at, if we look at the number of documents, we actually ended up with a document for the user and then 10 documents for each of the lists. In the case of doing a few documents, it doesn't really matter, right? We have uh, a, a, a reasonable limit per, I believe it's month um, for the free tier. But imagine we get to have a popular application out there. So this popular application uh, has lots and lots of users who have a lot of lists. When they open the application, we're paying for 10 document reads, sorry, 11, right? One for the user plus 10 for everyone to list. What if we restructured our application so we only paid for one? So let me show you how we could do that. So what we could do is we could modify a user 
So a user has a name, write an email, an ID, and then let's also put in the, a subset of the information from the list. Okay, let's actually put in the names and IDs of the 10 lists that should be displayed when we first open the application. Right? So there may be 100 or 1,000 of them, but we're going to just store these 10 here. We'll also store them in the list subcollection, but we're caching that information here, I guess. So we could keep a cache of, you know, we could really keep it sort of just like this. So we could keep, um, the question is if we want them to be, well, yeah, here's how we could do it. We could just keep an array. Arrays can't create array, can't contain arrays, but arrays can contain maps. So we could keep in, let's say, the name, the ID, and these have values in them. Uh, the name, the ID, and the uh, we could keep the creation date, or we can just keep sort of an order. Right? All we really need to know because when we're again dealing with this array, when we add elements to the array, the order isn't necessarily maintained, right? So we don't know what, what location something's to come in. So we'll keep at most 10. And the idea then is when we bring up a user, we have already their name, their email, the ID, and we have the 10 lists that we might need to display on the front screen. So that allows us to display on the front screen everything we need with one tenth, one, one eleventh, the number of document returned. Okay, now there's a problem. And the problem is if we go ahead and update our lists. So let's say we change the name of a list. So we change the name of a list. then we've got to change it in the lists subcollection. And then we've also got to update the lists field in the user. And by updating, really, remember all we can do with an array is remove or add. We can't change any of the elements within the array. So what we would do, we would take out the existing um, map for that particular list. And then we would add a new map with our updated name. Similarly, if we change the order of the lists, we have to change the order that they're gonna appear and that may require changing uh, you know, all of them to update the order. Let's say we moved the last item in the list, the 10th item to be the first item. Right, so now the order, instead of being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, is you know, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we've got to go change the order of, of each of these. So the cost is it's more work when we're doing an update. But that's OK, because we probably do orders of magnitude more reads than we do writes. Right? Because what's going to usually happen? The user opens up their app, they look at their lists, they click on one of the lists. Okay? Well, we had all we needed, all the information we needed to display all those. And we actually have the ID of the list I clicked on too. So now we can directly go to our sub collection and ask for that particular list. We might choose to do the same thing in the lists, uh, in the lists collection. That is for each list, we might wanna choose to cache the items to be displayed when we first show that list. Right. Uh, again, under the theory that perhaps they're just looking at this list and mostly doing reads and not doing writes. So we can just display, you know, 10 or 20 or whatever would display in the first page. If we go beyond that page, then we've got to actually do a real query to the items subcollection to find those items.
let's talk about indexes. So an index is an additional data structure that's added to a collection to allow you to do quick lookup uh, based on a particular field or fields. So let's just look at an example. Let's say we want to have an index on users dot name. Um, and so there are some default indexes that Firestore will already create for you. So basically, if you have any top level field, it will go ahead and automatically create indexes on those for you. There are two types of indexes. So there's an ascending and a descending index. And so if you have the name, what that allows you to do, for example, is do ordering. So you can sort either in alphabetical or reverse alphabetical by using this index. Uh, without the index, if you retrieved a thousand users and wanted to sort by name, you'd actually just have to do an in login sort on those thousand. Okay, or if there are a million, it's even worse. But the index will allow you to do that in linear time. The second thing the index, so, so these allow sorting. And again, depending on which index it is, you can sort alphabetically if it's ascending or reverse alphabetically if it's descending. And the other thing this allows is uh, equality testing. So you can do exact testing uh, in linear time. You can also do less than, so ordering basically less than, less than equal, greater than, greater than or equal. Okay. So these are all the types of queries that can happen given an index. So if you want to go look up a user by ID, right, that would be equality testing. That's an order one operation, not an order n operation. Requires, of course, auxiliary storage to store this index and requires when you are updating a document and changing a name, for instance, it changes not only the name for that document, but also it then has to go change a name index of the auxiliary information. And you have to pay for that, right? You pay for the indices because they take storage. And so they're gonna cost extra storage. Uh, and there's also a maximum number of indices you can have for a particular collection. So you can have indices on these first level fields. Uh, you can all, and by default you get those, although you can turn them off if you want. Uh, and then by default, the multi-level indices are not specified. So if you have, for instance, a user, right, this is the users, user in users collection. And you've got a name, and then you've also got, let's say, a uh, address. And this address is itself a map. So you've got a city, state, you know, zip, and so on. Well, now, if you wanted to find, for instance, all of the users whose address was in a particular zip code, so you could say, you know, db, uh, and I'm not going to put the exact syntax here because uh, we're going to talk about syntax later, but basically get users where uh, address dot zip equals, you know, 91768. Well, by default, that's going to be slow. Okay, it's going to have to go through every single user to do that because by default, we don't have these multi-level uh, indices. Now, the fact is, you probably don't want an order in operation. You don't want any of your queries to be order in. So if you try and use this query, you will get a debugging message that basically says you don't have an index on addresses.zip. 
And then it's very easy to go to the console of Firestore and go ahead and create the uh, addresses.zip index. Uh, in this particular case, if you're just doing a quality testing, you can pick one of ascending or descending. There's no reason to have both unless you actually want to be doing sorting in both ascending and descending. Let's talk a little bit about using Firestore. So, so if you want to get started with Firestore, you basically just create a database, okay, in Firestore. So this is in the cloud. You create a database, all right? And although it's possible to have authorizations, permissions, to begin with, you can just create a database that's wide open, that anyone can read to or write to. So you create a database, and then it's possible from the API to go ahead and create both records and collections and do queries. So you don't need to specify really anything else. Just look and make sure that's true. So you just create the database and then you can, in let's say a web app or desktop app, or what else can we have? Uh, let's look at a mobile app. You can create documents. And basically when you create a document, you specify the root level, assuming it's a, it's a brand new document, not in the sub collection, you can just specify the root level collection you want and it'll automatically create correct collections for you. So it'll automatically create the needed collection for you. If you have an existing document and you want to create a document in a sub collection, you just go ahead and do that, specify the sub collection name, and again, it'll create the sub collection if it doesn't already exist. So you can create documents, it'll automatically create collections, you can query, you can change documents. So the idea is really we have little need for admin. What do we need to do for admin? We need to do any authorization rules. Okay, um, we'll, we'll talk about that at a later date. We need to modify the default indexes. So as I said, the default indexes are on the top level uh, field. And so if, if you want nested ones, then you can discuss that directly. Or if you need compound uh, indexes, that's also possible. So let's say that you want, in this previous slide here, so you want to sort by zip code and then name, okay? So you're gonna have, let's say, zip code 0000, zero, 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 zero and then names from A to Z, and then zip code 0001, zero, 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 names from A to Z. Well, that we will want, we need a compound index for that. So we would need to create, and this would be creating in the cloud, in the Firestore 
administration console, we need to create an index on zip ascending and then name ascending. So for admin, we need to uh, add or delete indexes. But keeping in mind that by default, the top level fields with single values in them are automatically going to get indexes. So if we suddenly have a new doc, a, a new field in documents, uh, that will automatically get indexed. Um, so this is really an example of what's called a serverless database. The idea is not that their server there, but it's that you don't have to administer it, right? You're just renting this. Uh, the only other thing you do when you create a database is you actually have to create it uh, in a geographic location. Okay, so basically you're specifying a data center for, for this. So that's gonna depend on where your customers actually are. So if most of your customers are in the US, then you would want to choose a data center in the US. If on the other hand, this is aimed at Europe, you would need to choose a data center in Europe and so on. All right, I think that's enough.